Shadows Literary Licensed Podcast episodes. Ben Stokes here, exploring all things Collinsport, Maine, and following the likes of the Collins family, and the friends and foes, with your co-hosts, Tom Diamond, Jesse Fultz, Mickey Ray, and Keith Chalgo, Collins family, story about blood relations, literally. Hello, welcome to the Literary Relations Podcast, and we're interviewing Mark Perry. Welcome, Mark Perry, to the, inter- well, the Literary Relations Podcast. Thanks. It's, I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled and honored. <laughs> and we got Tom Diamond with us as well. Hello, Tom. Yes, you found me. Uh, I just curled up from uh, the crypt to uh, join everybody here. Nice to see you all here, and nice to, nice to see you, Mark. This is a privilege for us. Oh, that's very kind of you. I'm, I'm, look, I'm just a geek. I'm happy to be here and, and talk about whatever you want to talk about. So I thought what we do is you start off, um, it, um, what got you interested in writing, producing um, for television? Well, the full story is uh, when I was in third grade in uh, uh, the town I grew up in, um, I had a, a teacher named Rosalind Hartzell. She's since passed away. But she would bring in photographs that she had found in magazines or newspapers, and she would have us look at the photograph and then write a short story. And it just ignited this, this love of writing in me. And, um, but the funny thing is, I look back on that, and when, um, like one of the, I remember vividly, in fact, I still have the story, she brought in a, a photograph of a, it was a black and white photograph of a man, an old man's hands that were folded very serenely. And the other kids wrote um, uh, stories about, you know, my grandfather's hands and, you know, hands in prayer and that sort of thing. And my story was called Jack Arthur serial killer. <laughs> and and uh, it was about a serial killer in London, it. which I knew nothing about growing up except what I had seen in the movies. And um, he's ultimately caught and shot by the FBI. And instead of calling Child Protective Services, I ended up getting the literary award from Mrs. Hartzell's third grade class, which is my prized possession on the wall of my office. Along with this was the Dick Van Dyke show where I would watch with my family and try to figure out exactly what Rob and Sally and Buddy did for a living, but it sure looked like fun. And then slowly the two things came together and I started out, I said, I want to do it all. I want to do, I want to do movies. I want to do television. And I did spec some features uh, with a partner and uh, that ended up getting an agent and or we got, ended up getting an agent, and then I uh, spec the Wonder Years and got into the Wonder Years in the third full season, and here I am. Well, I, I wanted to also add because you did a monumentous thing for, for yourself, and you went to the University of Georgia, and apparently didn't have a film school, so you went to you, you literally uh, had your own degree. You, you went. You took classes from film, you took classes from the Henry Grady School of Journalism, you did playwriting, acting, directing, and cinema in the theater department. You literally done what they should have done. They should have given you the education that you got for yourself. And, uh, and that, that is, I think, it's, that's, I think, an achievement. You really did curriculum development for yourself. And uh, you, have your, you had your bachelor's in broad class journalism. But what you're also uh, too modest to tell us was the fact that you got a Claudie. And can you tell us what a Claudie is? <laughs> yes. We're giving, um, we're giving you trivia questions. Yes, okay. about my own life. This is, this is a challenge. Um, it, that was the award for excellence in student filmmaking at the University of Georgia. It was named after a film professor who had uh, died young. I think he died of a heart attack. But so they uh, came up with this award and I, I did 
eight millimeter student films and then I did 16 millimeter student films. And my two big 16 millimeter student films were big period pieces where I managed to cobble it all together. It was, both of them were set in the 1940s. Um, and I ended up getting the Claudie from the University of Georgia. But yes, they, there was a screenwriting class in the journalism school, which was interesting, um, a good teacher. And, but I took, you know, cinema classes in the drama uh, school and uh, theater, and that was my minor. So I just sort of cobbled it all together and was determined. And then I finally made the move to California in 1985. And okay. here I am. And that's I have to call it Pete Callison for all the for all the trivia nuts who are busy <laughs> writing this down and who cares. Um, yeah, that's but, right. But you'll but you'll you'll know me as a, as a as a trivia buff when I do my research. And you did industrials also. You produced industrial. Uh, oh uh, yeah, yeah. For Southern Bell, General Motors, or OB. I mean, you know, you you really took the bull by the horns, uh, and of course. You know, only you can tell me what kind of academic help you had on this, but you, you really seems it seems that you really went in terms of a passion. You went after this with a passion, considering uh, you you know you didn't have a lot of formal guidance to work on. That's that's commendable. Well, thank you. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, and I think that ended up being an asset because I sort of stumbled my way into it just because I knew what I wanted to do. I. The industrials were interesting. That was a three, three or four year chapter in my life working for, I started in the, with a small production company and we did a thing, as you said, for Southern Bell, which is what the phone company was called then in, in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I ended up in San Francisco briefly for a year and I worked for a production company there and we did, uh, a big annual meeting for Oral B, and so I produced segments. The each product manager wanted to have a theme, and so the guy who was in charge of toothbrushes wanted to do Raiders of the Lost Ark. So we did Raiders of the Lost <laughs> Brush. One guy wanted to do a Hollywood musical number. Um, we did a we did a noir thing. <laughs> Uh, with still photos. And these were all big slideshows. We, we didn't even do video because video was too expensive back then. So we had these, we would go in with 16 slide projectors in these banks, all registered to the same spot on the screen, controlled by a computer that was synchronized to an audio recording. And that's how we put on these big, uh, big industrial shows for product uh, introductions and that sort of thing. The world has changed a lot since then. It was called multi-image was the process. Wow, wow. And then, of course, you were working as an office temp by day while you were churning out these uh, screenplays and, and scripts. And, and now we get to the wonder years. And I, uh, I want to give this back to Keith because I'm, I'm not monopolizing this. Keith, do you have any, uh, do you have any uh, questions you wanted to ask him? Well, before you did the Wonder Years, you did do uh, an episode of Northern Exposure. What was that like to come into a TV series um, as a writer for one episode? Well, actually, what happened was um, on IMDb, they list the years. Usually the years for the show are the, the year that the show started. So I actually, the, my first job was the Wonder Years. Okay. And I was on that for three seasons. I left before the last season. And my agent said, what do you want to do now? He said, you're coming off of the Wonder Years. You can go into comedy or you can go into drama. What do you want to do? And I said, you know, I think I would basically die if I had to sit up till four in the morning and be funny in a comedy room. So I said, I'd rather go into drama. And they got me a uh, spec script or not a spec script. I'm sorry, an assignment to write an episode of Northern Exposure and it was interesting. I was a fan of the show. I don't know. I know it's back then there were more freelance writers who would go from show to show and, you know, just adapt and, and write an episode. But in my case, I was, I had at least watched the show and was familiar with it. And that, you know, broke the story with the showrunners and wrote the script. 
And it was the episode that introduced Anthony Edwards as the guy living in the bubble who was chemically insensitive, as I recall. And that script got me into Picket Fences, where I was hired for the first season on Picket Fences. Well, The Wonder Years was quite, um, it's kind of an outstanding show to a certain degree that it's almost one of the first shows in that were coming out in the 90s or I guess the late 80s, early 90s, where it started to serialize storylines, you know, where, you know, they weren't, it wasn't so episodic. It's like, you know, you had a continuation of a storyline that was continuing from episode to episode. How did you find that format from a, because television before that was pretty much, unless it was Dallas or Dynasty, almost every show was just episodic. Basically, whatever happened to these characters by the end of the episode, the next episode, it's like nothing's changed from the right. previous. <laughs> right. you know, Did they learn Dallas, nothing? Dallas, Hutt, Bojack, so on and so forth. Um, so with the Wonder Years um, being like that and being, I imagine you had to be quite a tight-knit um, writing crew for that because you do have to carry storylines forward and onwards as you're going through Arnold's you know, puberty as well towards the end <laughs> as it went into eventually. So how did you find that working with with a writing crew? Oh, it was, uh, it, there's nothing better than a group of really talented writers to work with because you can all make each other look really good. Mm-hmm. And there were some great writers on the Wonder Years. I was, I mean, I was so intimidated when I started as a staff writer driving into work my first day, I thought, you know, they're going to find me out any minute now. (laughs) But um, I, first of all, it really helped that I loved the show. When I saw the first, the first episode I saw was actually the second episode called Swingers. And I absolutely fell in love with it and was I thought, okay, I'm going to try my hand at one of these because I was specking a lot of material. I mean, to date myself, my first spec script was a murder she wrote, um, which landed me an agent. And then I also specced a couple of things for the CBS revival of the Twilight Zone in the 80s, uh, which you know I got nice feedback on the scripts, but no traction. And then I wrote this Wonder Years, which was based on an experience I had had when I was a kid, as were most of the episodes of the show based on somebody's experience, which is why I think it had such a universal appeal to both adults and children because the children could relate to the stories, you know, the kids um, because they were going through those same issues still and adults, you know, obviously through the lens of nostalgia looking back, but that show was a real writer's show. The writing, the voice of the narrator was, um, it was a challenge, but it also was was really fun when you nailed it. So I have I have very fond memories. A lovely cast, a good group of people. Um, just I was so happy when the DVD set finally came out and they had restored most of the original music. Some of them they still they couldn't license, but it, I couldn't watch the show when it was on the streaming services because they had replaced so much of the music that was such a part of the show. Oh wow. And it just wasn't the same. I mean, you know, it was, I think, Rod Stewart singing the theme song. I'm sorry? They had the same problem with American Dreams when they, um, because that was, you know, with Britney Snow and um, so on and so forth. And they couldn't license a lot of the original music. So you get the DVD set and then basically it was just like, you know, this odd music would come across (laughs) sort of thing. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's that's music licensing for it people as well which is kind of odd i'm curious as to how working with uh fred savage and danica mckella uh they were they were extraordinarily bright kids and uh they seemed to you know they seemed to have a real penchant and i think she went into mathematics later on she was a she was a math buzz you have any do you have any memories of that well fred was a character he was really fun to work with he I mean, we would sit at lunch and talk about whatever he was reading at the time, you know, in school, because they had to be in school, obviously, part of the day. Um, And he, for some reason, nicknamed me the Ripa. And I, to this day, I don't know what that means or what it was, but 
anytime I would come near the set, he would go, it's the Ripper. And I go, okay, that's fine. And then one of my favorite photographs is the night. It was the last night of shooting of season five. And I told Fred and his family that I was leaving the show and he grabbed me by the neck and started to strangle me. (laughs) Um, And then Danica was lovely, but she was very quiet. She was very quiet and, and she seemed very studious. Uh, Obviously she was, Um, but, and then Josh Saviano was a character. I mean, all it was, it was really, really fun. I felt like I was getting to relive my own wonder years by, you know, not only being around kids again, but to get to write some of those stories. It also wow. kind of gave birth to like the dramedy as well, wasn't it? Whether you had comedy drama mixed together um, as well. Um, how, how did you find writing like the heart felt moments against the comedy? Because that's a really hard balance. And Wonder Years seemed to balance that very, very well. You'd be laughing, laughing, and then all of a sudden your heart's breaking and t- you know, your tears are roaring down your face. Yes. And that is because I've always believed that humor is the way you win an audience over. If you can laugh with the characters. And the Wonder Years was not a joke show. It was a character humor show. And if you can laugh with the characters, it, it opens up your heart. I mean, laughter is phenomenal in that way. It can open up your heart so that you can get those sucker punches in at the end, because you, you know, you're, la- as you say, you're laughing, 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 and then boom, you know, you make your point and it really lands for people. Now, after the wonder years, you did take a few episodes where you kind of went to the other extreme for something very, very serious, which was law and order. So what was <laughs> so what was the um, that must have been quite a contrast to go from a warm fuzzy show to like Law and Order sort of thing. Well, yes, uh, that was a very strange chapter in my life. I, when my agent called and said, "Dick Wolf read your," uh, he either read a Picket Fences or maybe the Northern Exposure. I don't remember. And he wants to meet with you. And I said, why? And he said, well, he wants, he, he's maybe interested in having you come on Law and Order. And I said, why? I mean, I, that's the last thing I ever thought I would be doing as a writer. But, you know, it was a prestige show. It was the season that Sam Waterston joined the cast after Michael Moriarty left. And uh, so I went and I had this meeting with Dick Wolf. He took me to lunch in Pasadena. And he, uh, he said he was interested in dialing up the character on the show a little bit and make it infuse a little more character so that it's not just purely procedural. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. So they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I started. And I think I co-wrote three episodes it was a struggle for me to it was really a struggle to sort of exercise a muscle that i don't think i really had which was the procedural thing Mm -hmm. and uh finally around episode 10 my agent called and said just so you know dick wolf's going to call you in his office this afternoon and let you go And I said, okay, do one thing for me. Don't do anything to change his mind. So so (laughs) I I am not embarrassed to tell you that I was fired from Law & Order. And it was a good thing because I walked right off of that show and into the middle of the first season of Party of Five. And I found a really good home for the next few seasons with some remarkable, wonderful writers and got to really tell more of the character kind of stories that I'm more accustomed to. Plus the fun part of it was Chris Kaiser, who was one of the co-creators of the show. He said in some interview once, he said that I I got to write the funny episodes of Party of Five, (laughs) which is an accomplishment considering what a tearjerker that show could be. Yeah, um, Party of Five was quite, it's kind of like the dawn of the, the teenage or young adult dramas that were coming out at that time. Yeah, Dawson's um, Creek and Party of Five, and it was, that was... Guess, to a certain extent as well, at that same time. Yeah, 
And it was, those were the shows, as I recall, that really started to use pop music as, uh, as part of the, the score. So, um, yeah, but I remember Party of Five was, it was kind of a phenomenon for a while. Uh, we had huge event for one of the episodes uh, at Universal City Walk. And it was jammed with teenagers who were there to see the cast. And we did a, it was a Lisa Malamed, who's a wonderful writer who I met on that show and we've become good friends. Um, she and I did a chat online where people were chatting and asking questions. And we did this, it was before, you know, it was what, 95 or something. And all of that was kind of new, but we did have a fan who started a, a blog where he wrote these scathing lampoons of each episode <laughs> that were so funny that we, we were like, we should find out who this guy is and hire him. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember on um, Party Live also, I mean, if you look at the cast itself, I mean, it's probably one of the only TV series where the cast actually did very, very well afterwards. You know, they're still all work. They're all still working, which is quite amazing, really, for a show with a young cast like that. Yeah, it's true. They they're all very talented. It was it was a, a really talented group of people. Yeah. Now, Northern Exposure and then you, and you did um, producing and writing for Picket Fences. Now, they were also two shows that dealt with very, they were very, very quirky with their characters and a very, very quirky storyline. How did you, you know, how did you like, you know, changing, it's kind of almost, you know, changing to a different dynamic from writing warm, fuzzy characters to warm, fuzzy characters who are very, very quirky? Uh, I, I embraced it. <laughs> I love quirky characters. I thought Picket Fences, especially that first season, it was just some, it was some outrageous television. Some of those courtroom scenes with um, uh, Ray Walston as, as the judge and Fivish Finkel as the, as, I can't remember his character's name, but he was the, the, the lawyer, the out, outrageous lawyer. It was, I didn't actually write much on that show because David Kelly, who created it, he wrote every episode essentially. And I quickly figured out that I was there to give him ideas. And so I had put together a file of like clippings and things. And I went in and, you know, I pitched an episode about this phenomenon called stray voltage, which is something that sometimes, you know, shocks cattle through the ground because there's uh, electrical power lines that have somehow gotten into the earth or whatever. And we ended up, he, you know, he took that concept and came up with a serial bather, a guy who was breaking into people's houses and taking a bath. And ultimately he gets electrocuted in one of the bathtubs. So it was interesting. I learned a lot about writing television, just watching what David was doing on that show and, and seeing when the scripts came out and what, how he would take, you know, I pitched him, uh, I said, we should do something based, you know, inspired by the Billy Tipton story, the, the jazz pianist who was a woman who had passed as a man and, you know, no one knew, including her adopted children. And um, that became a, an episode about a transsexual in the church pageant, and it became this whole issue thing. So it was fascinating to watch David take a kernel of something and then turn it into a, a David E. Kelly extravaganza. He also is very good about pushing the envelope as well with um, things as well. David Kelly, if you look at Ali McBeal and some of the stuff that they're handling and picket fences, though there's a lot of humor with the way he pushes it. It's interesting the way that they're able to push different things. They're kind of were still a bit taboo at that time in the early '90s. You know, not yeah. like today where everything's kind of wide open now, but at that time, sort of thing. Yes, very much so. Um, and you know, uh, it's he's done well. <laughs> <laughs> now he also went into One Tree Hill, which was another teenage phenomenon at the time. Um, it's there. Um, what was that like working with? I mean, they were kind of a that's kind of a cast of pretty much unknowns at that time. I mean, they're yes, as I recall. Um, I went on to that show. My friend uh, Ann Hamilton was. Uh, the showrunner 
And uh, she brought me in. And, you know, because I had done Party of Five, it seemed like a good fit. Although I did reach a point, I was there for the first two seasons, and I reached a point where I thought, I I'm too old to be reliving my high school years over and over and over again. I want to, I want to write something more mature. So I left after the first two seasons. I had no idea that show would run as long as it did. Um, actually, uh, I kind of skipped a little bit because I probably, what we should touch on is um, how you went from the, the party of five and then you did, you had to do a sequel one of the characters called Time of Your Life. What was it like trying to come up with a spinoff of a, a series that you worked on? Well, I didn't have to come up with it. That was the show, the, the creators, Chris Kaiser and Amy Lippman. They came up with the spinoff and it took a lighter tone um, with Jennifer Love Hewitt's character who was always kind of a victim on Party of Five and now we were kind of I was writing my first episode of time of your life and I just had this epiphany. I said, Oh, we're doing a modern day, that girl. That's what this is. You know, she's single on her own or she's got a boyfriend or whatever, but you know, she's, and she's in the big, on the, side. <laughs> the big scary city. And I thought, okay, this is fun. And I had a ball and Jennifer Garner was the, the co-star who played her roommate, and that show was really uh, Patrick Fabian was in it. And it was, it was a delight to work on, but it never found an audience. Uh, I think people just weren't that invested. So we, we only did, I don't remember how many episodes we did now, but we were canceled, taken off the air. Sometimes. Yeah. Norman and Mary seem to do very good at it, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> the spin off just seems to be a bit, I don't know. There's always for every every successful spinoff, there's like twenty or thirty for somewhere somewhere that don't find their audience for some whatever reason or something. That's true. That is true, and this was certainly one of those. We should also mention that on Party of Five for the Four Seas episode, you were nominated for a Writers Guild of America award. Uh, oh shucks. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh, you see, I'm see. I've got a list here. I'm just checking them. I was going to say I'm, you did a deep Keith, dive. Keith is asking for the. Well, what do you think of the right? You know, because Keith, of course, is an is a established writer in his own right, and I uh, don't want to. Uh, I don't want his face to turn all colors uh, because the man is a Renaissance man. We call it polymath in America. Uh, but you for for uh, Party of Five, you share the Golden Globe Award for Best Drama. So let's not, uh, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's bust your buttons here. You were going to say something? No, I was just, I was just basking in, <laughs> in memories. Uh, yes, uh, Party of Five won a Golden Globe for Best Drama. We were the underdog, and that was a huge deal at the time. I don't remember who we were nominated against, but um, we uh, and the producers, again, Chris Kaiser and Amy Lipman, they did something extraordinary, which is they actually made sure that the other producers on the show also got an actual Golden Globe Award, because usually it just goes to the creators of the show. Mm -hmm. and so there was a day after the Golden Globes when we were all called down the hall to their office individually. And we didn't know what was going on because we would go in and they would say, we wanted to give you this. And they, give, they gave us an actual Golden Globe, which was amazing. And then they said, don't tell anyone when you go back in the room what we're doing. So we'd come back in and everybody was like, what's, what's going on? What's going on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, are we being fired? Like, no, we're getting a Golden Globe Award. Mm -hmm. And then I was, I was at the Emmys the year the Wonder Years was nominated but did not win, um, which I still think it should have. But, um, uh, but then we, I did manage, because I was a producer on Picket Fences, when it won Best Drama, I did manage to snag a, a statue for that. So that was fun. You shared an Emmy Award for Outstanding Dramatic Series on Picket That's Fences. That's right. 
And, Talking uh, about award-winning shows you worked on, what was your experiences on Brothers and Sisters? Brothers and Sisters was a short experience for me. I went in to help them get started with the second season um, after the showrunner had left. And that was working with Greg Berlanti, who is um, he's a television phenomenon. Um, and uh, I was just there. And then the writer's strike happened in 2007. And, you know, everything was kind of up in the air. And I, I left the show then. But that was a big show. I mean, that, and, and, you know, to get to say I worked with Sally Field, that's a treat. So, yeah. Well, even Rachel Griffiths as well. I mean, she's phenomenal as well. Oh, well, yeah. So, I mean, Calista Flockhart and uh, oh my God, yeah. uh, Matthew Reese. Oh, you know, yeah, it was great. And plus, um, Rob Below looking like he's never aged. I don't know what I don't know. I know. Well, he's got he's Dorian Gray. He's got a portrait. <laughs> he's got a portrait. Uh, <laughs> but also Dave Annabelle and Emily Van Camp who I then, I went on to work with both of them on other series. So, Revenge was with uh, Emily Van Camp. And uh, I did a short-lived series on NBC called Heartbeat. And Dave Annabelle was one of the series regulars on that. You were executive producer there. I was on that show indeed. Yeah. As well as Revenge, you were executive producer on the two seasons. The first two seasons of Revenge. I was on the first two seasons of Revenge, and then there was a shakeup, and I quit. Um, but uh, that was a wild ride doing those first two seasons of that show. Well, Revenge mm. is one of those shows that uh, was quite interesting because you have your continuing storyline, but it's a storyline that has lots of twists and turns. So what you might know at the beginning of each episode is not exactly what you know by the end of the episode, which then will keep you hanging until the next episode. Yeah. I mean, what was, that must take a lot of planning to put a, a season of that together. It more work than planning. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I mean, we had a general shape for what we wanted to do, but then, you know, when you got into the specific episodes, I look back at that show. I don't know how we did it because we blew through so much story in, in an episode. There's like, mm -hmm. good heavens. Another show might've taken two or three episodes to get from the beginning of that episode to the end, but it was one of the signatures of the show. And I, people used to, when they found out I worked on revenge, they, they wanted to, they, they would you know, press me to, can you tell us what's really going on? And it's like, no, you know, lips are sealed, but it, you know, that was, like I went to a wedding back in Georgia where I, where I, where I'm from. It was uh, my niece was getting married and all the relatives were coming up to me. They wanted to sit at my table because they wanted to talk about revenge. <laughs> That's funny. I, I, I mean, I was an avid watch for revenge. It's just like, I mean, I have to sit there and say it was another one of those first shows that basically it's, it moved at a hundred miles per hour and basically, you know, but I did wonder from the writing side of it, it's like, did you have a Bible? Did you have to go back and start from going back? It's like, well, look at this character. Because, I mean, you know, see, as you said before, each episode, each character went through these huge arches. So what, how did you make this great big plan? Because you could lose contact, you know, which we've seen in other, you know, other TV series where they kind of would lose the thread for a while before they could pick up because they forgot what they were writing about or what was happening with their characters. Well, this is this is a this is a thing about network television, and when you have uh, an order, you know, you get your first thirteen. Or it used to be you get a first thirteen, and then a back nine if you were successful, and that's a lot. That's that's you know twenty two, twenty four, forty five minute movies written, produced, and aired, or written produced in ten months out of the year. That's a lot. And so it is, it is easy to, you know, lose your way as you go. But if you have, you know, we had a general shape. We would, at the beginning of the season, we would talk about where we wanted to go for the season. And then we'd pitch specific ideas, like who's she going to take down, you know, how we need to do another takedown episode. Um, but it was, 
I always say it, it was like Lucy and Ethel and the chocolate factory that the conveyor belt starts going. And once it starts running, it doesn't stop. And you just, you just keep working. You also, um, I mean, you also did work on two big TV series that also brought Hollywood into the TV series, you know, with Sally Fields, you know, who was a, who said before that says she's never going back into television due to, I guess, have to fly. I guess flying none was enough for her for television outside of Sybil. <laughs> but, um, and then, of course, Madeline Stowe, who was another, another um, film actress. How was that like bringing them into the TV format with, you know, I mean, they, they're not like shows that were are produced today where we have 10 to 13 episodes per show and they can go off and do other things. I mean, these are like year commitments shows, 24, you know, 24. 22 to 24 episodes per season. So what was it like bringing, you know, working with them into this new format for film actors who thought television was below them. It's like they would graduate from television and never go back. But now you kind of, you you know, two shows that you worked on were kind of bringing film actors back into television where they can go into television and go back and forth now. That's true. And, you know, to me, I don't, that's, that's an individual's decision, you know, that if Sally Field looked up and said, I want the, I, w- I would like the stability of, you know, a network show. Um, excuse me. Uh, you know, there might be various reasons. Like, I don't want to travel. I don't want to go on location. I want to just, you know, drive to the studio every day and, and do my job. Uh, but I think from a storytelling point of view and just, you know, from a fan point of view, that brings such added value to a show. I mean, I cannot imagine anyone else playing Victoria Grayson besides Madeline Stowe. Mm -hmm. And once we, you know, got in and really she, those characters were so much fun to write for. Some of that dialogue was just, I remember the New Yorker review called the show venomously delicious and I thought, yes, that's what I want to write. I want to write venomously delicious. Well, another thing about the shows as well, I mean, they're big ensemble shows as well. But another thing is, you know, for Sally Field and Madeline Stowe, I mean, they are doing a movie a week sort of thing where, you know, the same same kind of screen time they would have in a film would basically take over six six to seven weeks. The right. same kind of screen time that they're getting in these 45 minute shows. So there's a lot of work. So I was wondering how that actually worked for them because, you know, as I said before, you know, scripts are also changing in a mile a minute, like rewrites and everything like this, give, you know, being handed out to them at a thoracic time. And, you know, as, as you know, with most films that you work on, normally the script, the script may change a little bit, but it's very rare. There's a lot of heavy duty rewrites going on. There might be some different, settings they might move from move it from one set to another or scene so on and so forth yeah i think it's more prevalent certainly in television with you know because you've got so many chefs in the kitchen you've got you have studio executives you have network executives you have directors you have everybody's weighing in and then there's production concerns if you lose a location or you know you can't afford something then you know you have to rewrite on the fly and i I admire the actors who are able to adapt to that when they get, you know, pages for that day's work. You know, I think about the soap opera world and, you know, my favorite TV show, Dark Shadows. And I think, how, how did they ever do that? Five days a week, an original play every day, which is, I mean, you can't even compare making a network prime time drama or streaming drama to what that process must have been like. So I, I have the hard, utmost respect for the actors. And some of them had a hard time with it. Uh, it depended upon whether they had a photographic memory or not. Nancy Barrett apparently had, had a phenomenal kind of memory, and she uh, would just simply uh, rattle off stuff. Uh, Robert Rodan, may rest in peace, who did an interview with his eight months before he passed, uh, as Adam talked about his uh, scenes with uh, Nancy Barrett as Carolyn and about the fact that she was an absolute terrific study. David Hennessy was also. But then again, you have people like Jonathan who was struggling with uh, memorizing his lines, uh, 
Now it turns out through uh, Mary O'Leary's biography that there may have been undiagnosed dyslexia that he did not. So it, it is amazing how he was able to not only function in that in that realm, but 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 do it well with difficult parts and uh, in Shakespeare. And then you had actors who were doing Broadway at night, so they're memorizing. Roger Davis would tell me that he that he he was doing Broadway at night. He'd have to literally let it, memorize his lines in the morning for shadows during the during the rehearsals. That is not that is not easy. It's really tricky to them. No, thank God for teleprompters. That's all I can say. And you see plenty of those. You know, and Dark story. Shadows, they even had actors fighting over the teleprompter at times. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my favorite bloopers is where you see the camera accidentally t- touch upon the teleprompter, and maybe you can read some of the words uh, going on. Because the bloopers, in my mind, make Dark Shadows really what it is. And, of course, as you said... Uh, they ne- they left them in because of the expense that it would have been to, to, to take to re to, to redo the takes because it was live on tape and also Dan Curtis said nobody's going to watch this uh, again you know so just you know because the actors were concerned nobody's going to watch this again just leave them in well the oh, rest is history about it, I'm sorry no the rest is history no, I, you know I've always heard the nobody's going to watch this again why did they save all the tapes. Curtis was very bright. Curtis was very bright. Curtis paid for them. He he paid for them. uh, And uh, nobody's going to watch it again. Let's save all the tapes and syndicate them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But for somehow, yeah. So there was obviously two minds going on there. Two minds going on there. Uh, Because, yes, you know, six of one and a half dozen of the other. But thank goodness he did save them, because we wouldn't be talking here today if he had uh, all these other soap operas. Uh, they were, uh, what's we call it? Uh, they were taped over for news broadcasts. There were a couple of fires uh, oh, yeah. in the seventies. There was one in the seventies in New York uh, at the ABC studios, and most of the tapes were uh, burned. Uh, and uh, but but anyway, so yeah, it, 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 I, I think Dark Shadows, you know, is a, is a good segue. Unless Keith has any other questions about this marvelous other career, uh, Keith, uh, where are we? I was going to ask you is that um you um you've also did some supernatural television programming with uh, Ghost Whisperer. What was that like? Ghost Whisperer was one of the most fun jobs I've had because it was the first time I got to do something with ghosts and um, plus it was my third series with Jennifer Love Hewitt. So I'm the only writer in town who can claim that distinction. Um, But uh, my friend PK, who I met on party of five, he was running the show and he called me during the writer's strike and he asked if I would, be interested in coming over and helping out. And I thought that could be fun. So I went in and the first thing they asked me to do was write a comedic episode of ghost whisperer. So I did. And uh, then I got to do that periodically and I got to do a huge episode. We, the, 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 there was a big fire at universal studios where we filmed and we lost some of the sets for the show between the, seasoned i started and then when i came back uh, they lost some of the sets and we had to do more location filming and we had insurance mercifully that was paying for it and so i'm also i'm I'm a huge ship geek i love ocean liners of the 20th century uh you know the normandy and the ss united states and all that and i i'm a big fan of the queen mary down in long beach and so I pitched an episode and we, <laughs> we got to film aboard the Queen Mary for seven days and the special effects guys were having a ball and we put the Queen Mary back to sea as the, as the last remaining three stack liner still in service. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was so much fun. I, we had a character, uh, 
named Rogo, and they found a guy who looked a lot like Ernest Borgnine from the Poseidon Adventure and uh, put him in a in wardrobe that was very similar to that. But I have really fond memories of Ghost Whisperer. I mean, Ghost Whisperer wasn't really a scary show. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also got to write an episode. I One of the, the best things that happened to me on Picket Fences was that Zelda Rubenstein took a shine to me and we became friends and we stayed friends. And today, coincidentally, is the 12th anniversary of her passing. And so I just want to tell this story very briefly. I wrote an episode for Zelda where she was going to play the ghost of a medium who had been debunking um, clients like in the 1930s, I think it was. And I wrote the role for her and she fell ill. She went into the hospital and she couldn't do the episode. It's one of the biggest disappointments of my life. That said, we ended up casting Deborah von Valkenberg and she she rose to the task. And, you know, it's like, these are, these are big, tiny shoes to fill. <laughs> and, you know, and obviously she's not a little person like Zelda was, but she, she just embraced it and she went for it. And, but it's, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's hard to watch that episode and not picture Zelda saying those lines that were written for her. So, uh, but anyway, we love you, Zelda. We miss you. I have to then say that one of my guilty pleasures is a Zelda Rubenstein film with he, that she did with Michael Lerner called Agony. <laughs> yes. And the reason why is because she is so good in that role, but at the same time, it's one of those shows, every time I watch the movie, I get like this really weird headache. And it really affects me. And it's, I love it though. I mean, it's, you know, I, I show it to people and they go, this is really intense. Oh my God, this sort of thing. And because I mean, most people only know her from Poltergeist, don't they? They realize, I mean, she's she's done a lot of stuff, but they yeah. only know the Poltergeist role. And I go, no, you got to see her in this. You gotta... No, so, she was extraordinary. She was truly extraordinary. And she had some great stories, and we miss her. Yeah. And she had some, and she could, um, she had a lot of meat behind her acting roles that I've seen her do as well. That I don't think that she, you know, unfortunately, you know, sometimes people actors get this one role that kind of that kind of defines them for the multitude. Where if you know, where if you scratch the surface and see other stuff that she's done, I mean, said before agony. I mean, it's, that she's bloody frightening. <laughs> I mean, it's not so, oh, yeah. I'm about it now I'm still kind of affected by it. So but that role in in the Poltergeist. I mean, that's you know, that's such an iconic part. You know, and and she's only in the movie for about ten minutes. I think. <laughs> He stole it away from Joe Beth Williams. And, you know, I love Joe Beth Williams. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes. You know, and then she was the best part of the second one. The second one. <laughs> Very much. I think so. they even brought her back to the third one for a little bit. It was just, it was like, we need to save this movie. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, she's incredible. Oh, that's, that's a shame, actually. So. Yeah. But anyway, Ghost Whisperer was a lot of fun. And then it got canceled. So. <laughs> As well, they do. So you dealt with, you know, so we dealt with, you know, you know, a homage to the past with dramedy, with comedy and drama. And then you dealt with, you know, young adults, um, dramas with Party of Five and also using quirky characters and quirky situations and picket fences and supernatural with ghost whisperers. So what are you be working on next? Well, I am determined to, uh, bring about a dark shadows renaissance. Uh, I am a huge fan of the show. I discovered it when I was in third grade in its original run. I am the cliche, the run home from schooler uh, devoured the show would hold a microphone up to the TV to record it on a cassette recorder. So I could listen to it again. And then I'd have to record over that tape the next day. Um, But I, you know, I wrote a play in the in fourth or fifth grade. I wrote a play that was Dark Shadows, and we produced it in class. And I just, in the 80s, when uh, I had moved to L.A., I, I rediscovered the show in syndication. I started watching it again, and it was the uh, Barnabas has 
Maggie Evans imprisoned in the old house and he's trying to turn her into Josette and watched that and uh, was just sort of rekindled because I hadn't seen it in years. And then I read that they were coming out with a new Star Trek series, a, a, a next generation of Star Trek. And I thought, why hasn't anybody done that for Dark Shadows? And one thing led to another, and I kind of moved away from it. I never really pursued it. Um, and then a few years ago, I thought, you know what? It's time. Of course, this was at the beginning of this reboot madness now where everything is coming back, you know. And But I've always thought that of all the things that get rebooted, Dark Shadows is one that really deserves another life. Yep. And so I chased down the rights, which were held by uh, Amasia Entertainment, um, a wonderful group of people there. And they had partnered with the Dan Curtis estate with Tracy and Kathy Curtis. And they had the rights and I had been pursuing it. They were looking to develop it. The timing was right. I went in and I pitched and they liked my approach um, to do the modern, uh, the, the continuation series, sequel series to pick up, drop in on the Collins family in 2022 or 2023, whatever it ends up being. And uh, that's what I've been pursuing. And we've got, we are currently having some interest. We've got, I pitched it before the holidays to two buyers and we are still very much in play where no decisions are made yet, but um, it's encouraging. And I'm pitching again tomorrow and we're setting another pitch. So I'm still out doing this. We developed it and we sold it to the CW. And as you probably know, you know, it didn't, obviously it didn't go there. They picked up their entire season or their entire slate of shows except for Supernatural, which had ended its run. And then um, we didn't get picked up. They released it back to us, and I redeveloped it, uh, rewrote the script. You know, I had made some concessions to the CW audience in the version that we sold for the CW. And so I sort of, as we like to say, I, I DCW'd it. Um, and so we have a script now that we're able to actually, oh, I'm sorry. I said, I guess that means you don't have to do a musical episode now. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be something down the pike. Now, yeah. be, now we don't know. We don't know. Never say never. A musical episode at some point. <laughs> Riverdale, uh, well, Sabrina had to move to Netflix. But even Supernatural did a musical psych, uh, musical episode. So do some do some can can in eighteen ninety seven. You know that kind of. Thing. Well, you know, all we need to do is bring in Pansy Fay. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and then we have it. Um, so th- yeah, that's what I'm doing now, and I'm really hopeful. You know, I, I I'm. Uh, I know there are some fans who are, you know, very sort of skeptical about it, but I really, I just, I love Dark Shadows. It's been such a formative influence on me and I, I want to produce a show that I want to watch because I want more Dark Shadows. And I'm, I am trying to be absolutely as respectful as I can to Dark Shadows canon, but as you all well know, the canon changed from one episode to another because they were all writing with their hair on fire and saying, nobody's ever going to watch this again. So, you know, it's like, Oh, nobody will remember that. We established, you know, Naomi died in 1830 in on the mausoleum wall or whatever it was. Um, there's enough hole. There's enough holes in the plot. So it's going to take a lot of fingers to plug. <laughs> well, the good news is that's all established. Uh, there are still questions that linger. Uh, but you know, I'm really picking it up modern day. Of course that the, the stuff that happened on the show is all part of the Collins family history and it will be referred to, but that's not really what the show is about. One issue I like the that, idea that you actually oh, bring it forward and not recreating and re 
buffering, uh, rebooting the same stories that we've already experienced and seen. So I quite I like that aspect of it. Well, I, think we, my... I think we got that in 1991. We kind of had a rehash of the whole. I mean, unfortunately, the Gulf War kind of ended that series. Due That's to, right. Due to yeah. series, um, along with Twin Peaks, was the down Twin Peaks of the Gulf War as well. Um, so I like the idea that you're actually carrying it forward for a modern audience and not rehashing things that we've already seen going in a, a fresh direction. But meanwhile, with an ode to the past. Yeah, that's that was. I mean, that's even part of the pitch. It's like I feel like the previous attempts to revive the show weren't successful, and part of the reason was ultimately because they were telling the same story with the same characters again, yet again. Mm-hmm. And fans are already familiar with that, but you want to attract a new audience and bring them in. Uh, so I I have always thought that the next generation approach would be the way to go. And and that's that's what we're doing. It's Our a, tough job. It's a um, tough job. It's a tough job. It's very important yeah. that you know if people want to know about what happened previously, it's all there for the to, to, to revisit. So therefore, you can move forward at the same time. But then, you know, if, if, if people want to get invested, they can rediscover the old season sort of thing. Well, the, so, the, the, what I want to do with this is look. I'm on record. I'm not a fan of that movie that came out in 2012. I'm not a fan, but I will say this. It has, it's done two things. It's attracted a whole new generation of fans to the original show to find the original and fall in love with it. And it's proven the lasting appeal of the dark shadows brand, because when it premiered on Netflix, just the beginning of this month, it, was in the top 10 most watched list on Netflix. So there is still curiosity about it. So I'm going to take that as a plus and not a, a, not a minus. Uh, And I would love to do a series that is engaging enough that people say, Oh, all this stuff they're talking about. I want to see that. And and then they'll go back and revisit the show and fall in love with it. um, Like, like I did when I was, in third grade what do you want to say tom can you hear me first of all yes okay good i just wanted to make sure um so one of the one of the minor concerns that i have was uh so you had mentioned on danielle's podcast that you'd like to you know your your vision is bringing back elements of gothic romance as well as gothic horror and blending them somehow uh, in order to form a kind of a synergistic effect. And what I think you have to remember was when Curtis uh, did this originally, and it was a pure Gothic romance, it was falling flat, and uh, it was in danger of cancellation. It kind of brought in the Laura character, you know, Diana Malay, Mm -hmm. as an experiment, and that kind of, you know, and and that kind of, revitalized things a little bit, but it was still destined to be canceled until they went into the gothic horror element. And from then on, once 210 uh, occurred, it became the Barnabas Collins picture show, I'm afraid. And it went into complete gothic horror um, with very little, with very little gothic romance. There was sprinkling. In your vision of the new show, how can you effectively balance the gothic horror and gothic romance uh, to your satisfaction and in a way that will entice both old and new fans? Well, that's a very good question, and I will say this. I have the benefit of hindsight for what happened with the original show. Mm-hmm. So very important, very important. You no, know, it's it's in the original show. Victoria Winters doesn't know who her parents are. Mysterious letter she goes to take this job, thinking she's going to find some clues. Uh, but there was no supernatural hook to that story. Mm-hmm. If you take a riff on that and give it a supernatural twist, because you already know that the show is supernatural, because you know what Dark Shadows became and what it's known for. Um, I think it it's organic to work in the romantic stories as long as they have some kind of horror element to them, which is what I'm doing. It, it's like a hybrid. I, I, I don't want to tell you the whole premise, but, you know, with, with the idea, 
the concept of I'm calling the show Dark Shadows Reincarnation. Uh, I like the sound of it. And I also because, you know, reincarnation is being reborn. And I think it works on two levels. It works on the show coming back in a new incarnation. But then the theme of reincarnation, which was a big part of the original Dark Shadows, where, you know, a person is literally reincarnated in different lifetimes. Um, that's also plays a part in the show. And I think that there is something inherently romantic in that idea. In the horror. There's something. In, yeah. In the reincarnation. Yes. In the reincarnation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think the closest you get. That, but I also think. I you was going to say. Well, a little bit with the Gothic romance and Gothic horror are one in our, are combined. Now we have histories of that now doing very, very well, where there's the vampire diaries. Or the Vampire Diaries spinoff. The Anne Rice um, series that's coming out is very gothic romance, mixed with gothic horror. So there is right, and, I, the and they all advanced now. I think than they were in the sixties at that time period. So you'd have to translate that then into reincarnation. Yes, uh, but all because... of those, all of the shows you mentioned owe a debt to Dark Shadows. Mm-hmm. I have said mm-hmm. time and again, mm-hmm. you talk about gothic horror and gothic romance combined, 1795. That's what that storyline is. And it has Very been good. it has been borrowed and exploited and ripped off any number of times on those other shows. One of the frustrating things about pitching this show is sometimes there are elements of it that sound derivative of other shows that people are familiar with, but because they don't know the original dark shadows. And I have to say, no, I'm not derivative. You're derivative. (laughs) Those are all things that were done on dark shadows and they were done first. Well, look at, um, let's take Buffy. Um, Probably the first of the serialization that started pretty much the serialization of television series as we know today Mm -hmm. sort of thing. I mean, Buffy, what do you have? You have a vampire slayer, who's fighting vampires, but her boyfriend is the reluctant vampire angel. Right. Yeah. And an angel goes mad for a few episodes and she has to win him back and, you know, so forth and so forth and back and forth. And then we get, you know, so that whole thing has premise to dark shadows. You know, well, they go back in time. We went back in time. How many times in Buffy or how many times in vampire diaries or how many times in various other shows that we now go back in time. It's not, to find out what the ancestors have been up to. So now it's it's faithful today. I think the most major challenge that you're going to have, Mark, in my opinion, and it shouldn't be hard to do it, but you have to um, counter against the Burton movie uh, and uh, the fact that, in my opinion, the Poison of the Waters although there were very few scenes, such as, of course, when the cast came back on in the cameo and the beginning of the movie, which showed the history of Collinwood. There was actually another script that was considered, by the way, for the Burton movie, and it was thrown out because it was judged to be too much, too closer to the original. And shame on them because of what they came up with. But I think that that is going to be a, ma- that is going to be a major challenge. Uh, I, I might be wrong. I mean, there's a enough time has passed and people have, and, and you know, people have forgotten them b- about it, but yet it's, uh, it's doing very well on Netflix. The Tim Burton film as well, because though the older fans may not have been in love with the Tim Burton dark shadows, it brought a lot, a younger perspective into the dark shadows. People who did not And in fact, who there were other people that start that started looking the at the original back into, back into dark shadows. A lot That's of our correct. Fans, um, even, um, you know, a lot of our fans for our podcast for the episodes are people who saw the Tim Burton film and that drawled them into the older one. So, so my question, yeah, my so question to you. Yeah. Older oh. fans, you're always going to have the older fans who are going to be very skeptical right. no matter what you do. Right. But I think, that, you know, but at the same time, you know, there are things about the Tim Burton film I liked a lot. There's stuff that I didn't like. If I if I take my history of Dark Shadows out of it, I actually do enjoy the film. But I have to kind of erase my m- memory of what Dark Shadows was right. because the performances are very very good. But then again, it is a very Tim Burton film, and Tim Ver- Burton films always have a beautiful look about them. Mm-hmm. But sometimes the 
that you kind of lack a bit of emotional. But I think that's going to be a challenge for you, Mark. Uh, how do you, uh, I mean, do you agree or, or disagree? And how do you anticipate meeting a challenge that, oh, no, not another Burton thing? Well, if I may say, I think it's by doing the absolute best version we possibly can okay. and let it look in my world, the Tim Burton movie, well, it doesn't exist in my world, but if it does exist, <laughs> if it does exist it's, it's, uh, it's a here, here. standalone anomaly and it was one approach to something. And I'm not telling that story. I am not telling the Barnabas, Good. Angelique, uh, Josette story. Uh, so I think when, when, when the pilot is produced and is aired and people get to see what it is that we're doing, it is a straight up gothic horror, gothic romance where the world is, it, 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 it's, it's just like on Dark Shadows, it is a world that exists and real people live in it. It's just it happens to be a world where the supernatural is absolutely real. And, you know, I said before, you know, as far as the, the Dark Shadows Tim Burton movie is, I think what you also have to look at the simple fact that it cost $150 million to make and it made $300 million. Well, why? So it did money back and it did make its money back worldwide. So you also have a, which opened a worldwide. I mean, when Dark Shadows first came out, open, it basically played in Mexico and maybe South America. And that's it. It never went to Europe or anything like that. So. That actually, that's actually a plus for us in terms of global appeal because everything now that gets produced, they're they're looking at what what's the international appeal, what's the international market for this. So, again, the fact that that it did well overseas is is a plus for us in terms of selling it because if you if you say it's a brand, then you know the brand has proven that it has some popularity worldwide. Yeah, it, and. You know, I think because of the Tim Burton film, it has given a international recognition of the name, which has helped. Unlike if it was just an American TV series, let's say um, Phyllis, or let's sit there and say All in the Family. Right. It's a huge well, remember movie. also that Jonathan... Knows what the, no one knows what the show is. They don't know what the show is. Keith, yeah, remember right. also that Jonathan did go to South America between 72 and 73 at Dan Curtis's insistence to promote Dark Shadows just after it went off the air because the Spanish language version of Dark Shadows, Sombras Tenebrosas, was very, very popular in uh, Paraguay and Uruguay and certain Nicaragua and certain South America. So he did do a tour. And this was all those years ago. So there's all, and of course, Spanish has always had a predilection, more of a predilection for vampiric horror in my view than uh than america has uh probably because of their own particular culture the dia de los difuntos the day of the dead and so forth um but i think the uh but the question i have for you and of course you've been asked this before mark is uh, the old fans, I think, are only going to be satisfied. Now, I think the music is also something, and it's a good thing. Uh, I heard somewhere that you're including music, but the old fans are only going to be satisfied if you can somehow get cameos or even or even small or even parts for the uh, for the original cast if arrangements can be made. And I know you have plans there, and I don't want to get into proprietary. Uh, into proprietary subjects, but can you comment on your attitude towards getting the original cast back into the show? I love the idea as it works with the stories. I absolutely, of course, I, you know, it, it's the best way to, to continue the legacy. Um, so I am completely open to that uh, going forward. This is very it's always good to have yeah. Easter eggs in whatever you're doing. So, what's that? It's always good to have Easter eggs in whatever you're doing. A little sure. bit. Here. And oh, the fact that you're an me, original a lot fan. Of the, <laughs> the fact that you're an original fan is such a plus, because you know the um, 
you know the genre, you know the ethos. It's not that like you're somebody that never looked at it before and you got to look at a couple of tapes and saying, oh, what the heck is this about? You know, that kind of thing. And I don't know how many, I don't know how people could have loved this. And then their job is to market this. Uh, you, you know, this is this is not, if, if anybody could do this, it is somebody with your background, with a combination, and I don't mean to blow, blow your bugle, but it's a combination of your expertise, as we've discussed, in other areas of the business, plus your, plus your, plus you're a fan at heart that truly wants this to succeed. And I said it before, if you're able to get this done, you're, you will be Jesus Christ to the fans. And uh, <laughs> okay, I quit. I'm out. <laughs> so you well, better get your water I'm shoes. Out. You better get your water <laughs> shoes. The four day weekend in the summertime. <laughs> you, you, you just killed the reincarnation right there. Ah, there um, I go. Now I'm going to get horrible letters. Now you've so, done it. Now you've now, done it. Now I've now I've done it. But you know something? Accept that possibility. If this takes off and if it's a success, uh, it's it. But even now, it's so respectful that you're that be, we everybody's like saying Dark Shadows is dead, you know. And, and I mean, you know, especially after the Burton movie, uh, and uh, it's 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 a mem- And here you're trying to keep that memory green. That is uh, that is a terrific. That is terrific because who else can do it? Who else can well, do it? And here's I- the thing: when when I first connected with Amasia, uh, I went in to pitch to Tracy Mercer, who's their television person there. And the the backstory there was that she had worked with Tracy Curtis when Tracy Curtis was an editor on Madam Secretary, which was a show that Tracy Mercer yeah. produced, and they became yeah. friends. Yeah. They hit it off. Um, and Tracy Mercer was a fan of the show. Her father had introduced her to it. And of course, Tracy Curtis's father created it. They worked together, they became friends. And then ultimately they realized that Tracy Curtis was the daughter of Dan Curtis. And so Tracy Mercer geeked out because of dark shadows. And sure. they decided to do, they wanted to do something to honor their fathers because Tracy Mercer's father had introduced her to the show. And they said, whatever we do, we have to get a fan. It has to be a fan of the show to come and do this. Otherwise it won't work. Meanwhile, I was developing this whole pitch dog and pony show um, and chasing down the rights. And then finally, the, like I said earlier, the timing was just right. I got in the room at the right time and they really liked my, my approach to bringing the show back as do I, and uh, so here we are, and and uh, I'm I'm feeling a little bit of momentum going still, which is good. So I just want to: Do you have buyers yet? I'm, I'm I'm sorry, I don't know whether I picked that up. We 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 have pitched to buyers. That's what we're okay. doing, and we're, we're the the two that we pitched to before Christmas are still very much interested. Good. So, but things good. are moving at a bit of a snail's pace. I think you know. COVID has not helped anything. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, and, and that's going to be a consistent and constant challenge, which is, which is not your, uh, which is not your fault. Uh, Keith, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I thought that would basically we go back to your Dark Shadows growing up days. And I thought I'd ask you a little bit of um, personal questions about what was your favorite storyline during Dark Shadows, just out of interest, the, out of the original series. 1795 and the introduction of Barnabas are my two favorites. Those are the ones that really stick out in my mind. I discovered the show literally walking through. My sister was watching it, and I walked in at the moment that Willie Loomis unchains the coffin and the hand grabs Barnabas, and I was hooked from that minute, and then I became obsessive. I built a life-size coffin in the basement that I used to make. <laughs> I made an eight millimeter vampire movie with my friend uh, Rick Brown and Larry McDowell. And we made a vampire movie with uh, that coffin. <laughs> and, um, so I was a weird kid, but you know, my parents didn't discourage it. Um, 
but I, the 1795, I said it earlier, I think that's like the greatest Gothic horror romance story ever told with Angelique and Josette and Barnabas. And it's, you know, um, and then Barnabas being released and back in the world and being such a bad guy when we meet him at first, you know, he's this, uh, it was just riveting. And, um, so those are my two favorites. I still would love to see a big stage musical done of 1795. Speaking of musicals, but that's not in the cards for the TV series. <laughs> they tried that at one point. They tried a Broadway <laughs> version and it didn't. I what don't know if this one for it. What was the worst storyline in Dark Shadows of the original series? The worst? <laughs> oh, dear. I, I can't. I just, I can't. Um, there's something to like about them all. How about the Leviathan? Well, I'm, I wasn't a fan of the Leviathans when I was a kid. I didn't like what Barnabas had become, but I will say when I rewatched all 1225, um, I actually didn't mind it as much as I had before. Um, I, I, I don't know. I have the, I, I I view the show so fondly. It's hard for me to say. Oh, I didn't like that storyline. Yeah, um, got so, a halo effect. I'm going to take a pass on that one. <laughs> the halo effect. I said there's a um, my favorite storyline was Laura Collins. For some reason, I love that. That's my favorite. <laughs> great storyline. That's I a great storyline. So it does. I like the idea that she could have burnt David alive. I mean, it didn't happen. But she tried to. <laughs> I do. And I quite like the whole Phoenix thing in the storyline, and there's a poeticness about that that I quite liked about that. It was very inventive, I thought. And, and uh, I mean, when they decided to go supernatural with the show, it was, it was a good way to do it. Yeah. There was a yeah. sadness to the first part of the Laura block, uh, which, in, you know, which we would ki- you could kind of identify with. But then when she was revitalized in 1897 she was more of a villainous and uh uh out to get what she wanted through uh whatever manipulative tactics she could so uh and of course it was a writer's decision which kind of stripped her of the original uh pathos that i think was uh was going on uh but uh i uh i i i i think you're spot on in terms of 1795 will always, I think, be, the way it was originally portrayed, will will always be classic because it came across as a, as a, the pre-vampire Barnabas, who was a naive, innocent guy who worked for his father in the office and was going to marry the rich gal and had no idea what was all because he had an affair with Angelique, had no idea of what he was, what he was in for. Uh, according to that, so it was a, uh, it was a, it was a wonderful, it was a I wonderful have to setup. And say though, looking at it from eyes from a twenty, this you know the twenty twenty view of it, I have to sit there and say there's a lot of age and appropriation that goes on with dark shows doing it from today. <laughs> it's like it's like all these old men she has to like twenty or eighteen year olds. <laughs> well, you know Barnabas. The character was 25 years old. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, I mean, Fred was 40. <laughs> you know, Fred was 43 when they cast him, I think. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. you know, but, but, uh, you know, he brought, here's the thing that show had a theatricality. Part of it was, you know, the, the way it was done basically live to tape. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think you, there are, you know, you can suspend your disbelief in that format a lot easier than you can with something you're watching on Netflix, you know? So I think, you know, you could say, Oh, they kind of did his hair a little differently when he was alive and he's supposed to be younger. I mean, he's got, he's 43 years old. He's got a nine year old sister, you know, it's like, what's going on. (laughs) But um, his sister's a menopause baby. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, but I, I, and but that's the, obviously the new show is not going to have that kind of theatricality because that that just that wouldn't work and it would probably land you right into the Tim Burton camp world, which is where we absolutely are not going. 
You got to also remember that Layla yeah. Swift had uh, brought on Broadway actors uh, at that point, New York yeah. trained Broadway actors, Louis Edmonds and uh, uh, Louis Ed- David Ford, David Ford, Thayer David, you know, all, all of whom had Broadway experience and they lended their Broadway theatricality to the performances. Uh, and so that kind of elevated it among the other soap operas of the day, which were, you know, set in hospitals and living rooms and, right. uh, you know, and, and, and whatever. It would be, it, it, it wouldn't, yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to translate that, uh, I think, into a new, into a new shadows. But do you think that if, if something, were to, because, you know, there was something about that that worked in the original show because it contributed, because everybody played it up so seriously. And I think their Broadway background was able to help them in terms of that. Sure. Do you think you could find, that you could somehow, this is a tremendous challenge, I think, to you, Mark, but do you think that you could somehow find a way to siphon a little of that Broadway seriousness into the kinds of into the kind of casting that you would eventually have to look for in a show like this. Well, yes, and that's uh, that's all about honoring the spirit of the original series, and mm-hmm. that's what we are intending to do. Um, if not, you know, imitating the original series, but certainly, right. you know, I we we want the best actors we can possibly get just like they got on dark shadows. I think there is no dark shadows. Um, it, you know, I know it always reminds me of a theatrical tour group, you know, where they would like, like a summer stock group. You have these actors. A repertory you know, company. Yeah. Yes. Show each, that's what I always kind of remind me of, which kind of has that, you know, which kind of gives it that kind of special theatrical but at the same time i mean soap operas up until really recently kind of did have that kind of stagey mm-hmm. you know feel about them whether it was you know even like general hospital or edge of night or all the other ones even you know even today where you kind of have this you know you know the actors you know the, you know you hear what's going on inside their head <laughs> you think no, well they did that quite a bit on dark shadows too <laughs> I, oh yeah oh yeah um, I loved the repertory company aspect of it. Uh, and, you know, I think Ryan Murphy has said that that was an influence on him in the way he did American Horror Story with the actors playing different characters. Um, but I loved that. And, but, I, you know, rewatching 1795, I have to laugh. Victoria Winters was a terrible time traveler because every time... <laughs> It really was. Every time somebody would be introduced, you'd go, oh, my God, you're, you know, oh, it's Carolyn. Oh, no, it's Matthew. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, she yeah. just gives it away. And I also thought it was interesting that if they had had the luxury of, as we were talking about earlier, if the writers of that show had had the luxury of really arcing things out, if they had known that Barnabas was going to catch on fire with the audience and that they were going to have to make him sympathetic and give him a little sister and give him a backstory and humanize him. If they had known all of that, think about the moments that could have been in the show that weren't there. Like yeah. when Barnabas first sees Elizabeth when he's out of the coffin. That's his mother. If you play that they all were dead ringers for those characters, as they did openly in 1795 with Victoria recognizing it's Joe. No, I'm Nathan. You know, you could have gotten and it. My God, Roger, it's his father. I mean, there could have been just just a moment of, of a look on his face, you know, that. Right. But they didn't know because they were, as I said, they were writing with their hair on fire and they were they were going beyond the back door. They were, going, yeah. they were doing it beyond the back door. Yeah. So I I admire what they managed to pull off. And I mean, look, we're all still talking about it, obsessing about it and posting about it. (laughs) So obviously they did, they did a lot, right. They did a great job. And that's being, I'm underestimating what I'm saying Uh, for us to still be talking about it 50 years from now. There's gotta be something there. 
And that's why I want to get a whole new generation of fans to come on board. Exactly, as well as the keep the uh, keep the ones that are currently, uh, uh, you know, keep the ones that are currently, uh, you know, interested. Uh, and that I think is, you know, what you're really, you know, is your your biggest challenge you're going to have. Obviously, the current ones accepted, but it's still the best thing we've got at this time, and uh, it's in and then some. It's to your credit that you're devoting all your energies to it. When very easily with your 32, 33 year career, you could have been devoting your energies to something more mainstream. Uh, that could have gotten you some more, some bucks. Uh, I just are- want to have fun, Tom. I, I, mm-hmm. I feel I've been very fortunate to get to play in this playground of television and to write things and have them produced and actually people watch them. Um, I've been very fortunate in that regard. And I'm at the point after those 33 years that I really, I only want to do something if it's going to be fun for me. And I cannot think of anything more fun than Dark Shadows reincarnation. I also have to add in the 32 years of all the work that you've done, also gives you a lot of kudos into presenting a Dark Shadows because of all the correct genres and different characters and all the different things that you've developed through the years. It's kind of led to your Dark Shadows time now. Correct. It would it would be a fine way to retire. I can tell you that. <laughs> it would be a fine way to be remembered as well. <laughs> And, so uh, on that so note, what we're going to do is I think it's time that we say goodnight to you and let you get on with your day. So thank you so much for doing this interview with us, Mark. It's nice. Thank to you, guys. You. This was really fun. I'm always happy to shoot the shadows. So that was fun. It was so it was so wonderful talking to you because uh, I uh, and when I first met you, I must confess to a feeling of butterflies in my stomach because I'm saying, my God, I'm talking to the one, and you're like, yeah, right. But I'm talking to the but as a but as but the fan part of me, the little seventeen year old kid that's in that's in uh, ensconced in this sixty seven year old body, but it is still there, is saying, my God, I'm talking to the person that is doing the most from a professional and personal standpoint to try and bring back the legacy and the uh and this and and the scope of what dark shadows was and what dark shadows can be and the fan in me thanks you and the professional in me is awed by your persistence uh as in 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 going to these people because it's not an easy thing it's not an easy thing you have to cope with rejection you have to you know you have to cope with uh you know people who you know oh yeah right well, i don't like the way he wears his tie you know that kind of thing and but you've got some good people behind you you got dan curtis's daughters uh, who are very, very into the project, and that legitimizes it. Mm-hmm. And I wish you the best of luck. Well, I thank you. Um, I, Like I said, I just want to have fun, and I want to produce something that I want to watch. So, mm-hmm. Excellent. And I'm awesome. honored to be entrusted with this amazing show. So. But We're privileged to have interviewed and you What today. I want to um, say to our, our next interview will be with Beth Grant, and then our interview after that will be with um, Jen... Um, Beard, um, Beaver, sorry, who's with Supernatural and working on The Boys at the moment, and you'll be with us in March. Of course, make sure you continue listening to our other episodes, which is American Psycho, where we have the author Brett Easton Ellis joining us to talk about his book, and we'll be discussing the film as well. So it's good night for myself. Good night, Tom. Good night to all, and it was a pleasure. And good, good night, night, Mark, and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. This was fun. I can't help myself, I put it down on paper All the different stages, memories of us That's the only way I know that I can shake it Writing all our pages, every single thought I know you don't like when I'm nostalgic No, you never try to understand Say you're doing fine, don't think about it like I do Sorry for writing all the songs about you I know that you hate that I got more to say Sorry for writing all the songs about you But I had to, oh I had to Swear no one will know that every moment was true
I can't wait for you to recognize the stories Like when you said you loved me Or that time on the rooftop Will you act as if you haven't even heard it Well, nothing of it really matters Cause I know you don't like when I'm nostalgic Go back to the start to get an end Say you're doing fine, don't think about it Like I do Sorry for writing all the songs about you I know that you hate that I got more to say Sorry for writing all the songs about you But I had to Oh, I had to So no one will know that every moment was true What we lost, what we lost I put it in words to clear my thoughts And just to get over, over us I had to, I had to Sorry for writing all the songs about you I know 